Welcome to Deep Dive Defense. Over here we give rare insights you won't hear elsewhere. In this video, we will explore the methods believed to have enabled Israel's highly complex aerial attack on Iran during the 12-day conflict. Simplistic misconceptions of conventional bombing operations, where aircraft overfly their targets, will be shown as inadequate to explain the events that were observed. Stealth fighters, air superiority, destroyed air defenses, all hyped claims that don't fit the reality. This operation represented the most technologically sophisticated application of air power conducted by any nation in the world and in history. Therefore, a hypothetical scenario for such an aerial attack will be presented step by step to illustrate the complexity and difficulty of what Israel accomplished and its limitations. First, however, it's critical that several fundamental dynamics between fighter jets and air defenses are understood. Fighter jets always prefer to operate at high altitudes above at least 3 kilometers, and optimally at around 10 kilometers, to remain within their most fuel-efficient flight regime. The more kerosene saved through high-altitude flight, the more fuel reserves remain available to engage the afterburner for supersonic flight and maneuvering should it become necessary. However, air defense sensors like radars can rather easily detect high-flying fighter jets. Consequently, Wherever such sensors are present and cannot be suppressed or neutralized, fighter jets can descend to lower altitudes to exploit two key dynamics. The first is the Earth's curvature. This means that aircraft flying at very low altitudes and at distances beyond approximately 40 kilometers will remain below the radar's line of sight. Radar waves, along with optical or infrared ones, will be physically blocked by the curvature of the Earth. The second dynamic that can be exploited is terrain masking. Terrain masking occurs when the sensor's line of sight is obscured by hills and mountains, rendering detection by conventional sensor systems impossible. Therefore, whenever a fighter jet faces the risk of detection by such air defense sensors, it can utilize these techniques to remain outside the sensor's field of view. To further understand the situation during the Israeli aerial attack, it is essential to recognize that with the downfall of Assad's Syria in late 2024, the airspace above that country became, for all practical purposes, completely open to Israeli flight operations. This new reality was a result of the complete collapse and significant destruction of Syria's air defense network, which had previously obstructed such freedom of operation. The other key element working in Israel's favor was its superpower ally, the United States which maintains a heavy presence across the Middle East region, particularly in the skies above Iraq, a country it had previously defeated and occupied. Hence, with Israeli and United States air power dominating the skies above Syria and Iraq, the flight path toward Iran was open and under full control. Adding to this strategic advantage, Iran's response to the attack involved sending one-way attack drones, such as the Shahed-136, toward Israel. This gave the United States the perfect pretext to become indirectly involved in the conflict's aerial warfare by intercepting those drones over Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. This situation essentially meant that the border region from which the attack was launched, specifically the airspace of Iraq, was under the complete air superiority of the United States, rendering any operations near these border areas extremely dangerous for the inferior Iranian Air Force and its older fighter jet types. This United States control over Iraqi airspace extended so far that it enabled the safe operation of Israeli tanker aircraft, as well as reconnaissance and electronic warfare aircraft, conducting their standoff operations against Iran. The favorable conditions for Israel, however, extended even beyond that. French and British fighter jets would help to support the drone interception operations across the Middle East, which reduced the operational workload for the Israeli Air Force. Their tanker aircraft could also refuel the Israeli fighter strike packages en route to Iran. It is also highly plausible that U.S. tanker aircraft refueled Israeli strike aircraft above the remote deserts of Iraq, further improving the conditions for the attack operations and once again lowering the workload for the Israeli Air Force. Yet, the single biggest advantage Israel enjoyed due to the United States was its real-time access to American electronic intelligence satellite constellations which were used to detect and locate Iranian radar systems, or to confirm their absence in certain areas. This unique high-tech capability to create real-time electronic battle space maps 
was the primary enabler for the type of air operations the Israeli Air Force conducted against Iran. Unlike the commercially oriented defense industry of the United States, the Israeli defense industry has concentrated all its capabilities on developing weapons with the highest possible performance and the necessary defense penetration capabilities for confronting its main opponent, Iran. Consequently, Israel has developed unique long-range missile systems like the Golden Horizon, the ROX, and the Rampage missiles, with ranges extending from 200 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. All of these are supersonic weapons that require high-end air defense systems to counter. Having established that, even the United States mostly possesses less capable long-range missile systems than those of Israel. The United States still lacks a high-end weapon for very high-priority targets comparable to the Israeli Golden Horizon. Nevertheless, the U.S. use of expensive standoff missiles, such as the JASSM, during its campaign against Yemen in 2025, illustrated that even the Yemeni air defenses, which were largely equipped by Iran and were much less densely deployed and sophisticated than Iran's own air defense systems, made conventional bombing too risky. Their ambush posture air defenses forced the U.S. to expend so many standoff weapons that the U.S. Pacific Command voiced complaints about why such relatively rare munitions had to be depleted against an adversary like Yemen. Hence, it would be highly illogical to assume that Israel's campaign against the significantly more powerful Iranian air defenses would have quickly enabled direct bombing raids instead of the low-risk use of long-range standoff missiles. Thus, it is certainly not so that Israeli Air Force pilots were braver than those of the United States, or that they possessed more sophisticated techniques. It is rather that standoff weapon attacks are difficult to distinguish from direct overhead bombing, and for Israeli public relations, it is more favorable to claim that aircraft like the F-35 had directly bombed Iran's capital city, Tehran, to apply psychological pressure on the Iranian population. At this point in time, deep penetration missions by Israeli aircraft into Iranian airspace cannot be entirely excluded, but they cannot be confirmed either. As previously mentioned, the precedent of United States standoff weapons strikes against Yemen suggests that the Israelis would likely not have taken such a risk. However, it cannot be entirely excluded that at some point, temporary attack corridors could have been created for limited bombing missions of very high priority targets. Therefore, let us examine several hypothetical scenarios of attacks by the Israeli Air Force which would align with the visual evidence of bombings observed in Iran. It will be explained how high technology and sophisticated tactics can enable situations where even Iran's capital city, Tehran, can come under attack without the Israeli side having gained air superiority over Iranian airspace. This scenario starts in southern Israel, near the Nevatim and Ramon air bases, which represent the most important starting points for attacks against Iran. F-16I and more preferably F-15I aircraft carrying drop tanks and two Rampage supersonic standoff missiles would be involved in this scenario. The aircrafts would take off and preferably fly at a low level, indicated by the light blue color of the flight path. The reason would be to remain undetected by human spotters who could otherwise report on the air activity from those bases to Iran. The low-altitude flight within Israeli territory therefore increases chances to exit Israeli airspace without being easily observed. Once above the Mediterranean, the aircraft would begin to climb without being well visible, reaching a cruise altitude of around 10 kilometers for the highest fuel efficiency. Then, somewhere in the middle of the eastern Mediterranean, southeast of the island of Cyprus, the first aerial refueling would take place preferably conducted by British or French tanker aircraft operating from the airbase in Cyprus. This early refueling is important because the aircraft, with their heavy payload of drop tanks and rampage missiles, would have consumed a high amount of fuel during takeoff and climb. Furthermore, conducting the refueling above the eastern Mediterranean airspace would mean that optical observations of those operations could be mostly excluded allowing for freedom in timing the attack as well as potentially concealing the fact that Israel's allies provided indirect support such as aerial refueling. Then, once near the Syrian Mediterranean coast, the freshly refueled aircraft would either fly straight above that region towards the Syrian central desert or descend to low altitudes and use terrain masking to fly through the local valleys to remain largely undetected. Once near the remote central deserts of Syria, the more efficient high-altitude flight could be continued preferably towards the regions largely under U.S. control in the southeastern regions. 
This flight path would continue towards the regions controlled by the Syrian SDF and Kurdish groups, which lowers the likelihood of human spotters being present, also due to the uninhabited condition of those regions. The flight would continue into Iraqi airspace in the northern Kurdish regions, where the second refueling would take place before the combat element of the operation would begin. Whether U.S. tankers were involved in these refueling operations remains unknown, but is considered well possible. The heavy U.S. air power presence in that airspace ensured secure operations without risk of interception attempts by Iranian Air Force fighter jets. With maximum fuel and drop tanks, the interdiction mission into hostile Iranian airspace would then commence. The mountainous terrain of northern Iraq would be exploited to remain masked by the terrain and the mountain's peaks, with a descent to low-altitude flight through the valleys once approaching Iranian airspace. This portion of the low-level interdiction would be approximately 60 kilometers long, and a corridor of that length would need to be created by air defense suppression assets enabled by U.S. intelligence capabilities. This would ensure no local air defense systems were active or present in that corridor, which could put the fast and low-flying aircraft at risk. After just several minutes of flight, the strike package would enter the airspace above the large Lake Arumia. While this lake is low in water level, it still represents a more secure flight path than flying above terrain. Consequently, the high speed and very low altitude would function as protection for the strike package to fly a further 130 kilometers towards the north. Then, the final portion inside hostile Iranian airspace would need to be flown for approximately 80 kilometers through the valleys, utilizing terrain masking to reach non-hostile Azerbaijani airspace. Therefore, the primary corridors that need to be created to transfer through hostile Iranian airspace towards safe Azerbaijani airspace would be the initial 60 kilometers to reach Lake Urumia, another 130 kilometers to cross the lake, and a further 80 kilometers at low level and high speed through the highly mountainous terrain to reach Azerbaijani airspace. Once there and with increasing distance from Iranian airspace, the flight altitude would increase gradually, and Armenia would be briefly passed through to reach the main non-hostile airspace above Azerbaijan. Here, a secure distance would be maintained to Iran's border to allow for efficient higher altitude flight without risking being inside the line of sight of Iranian radar systems. This efficient flight would continue until the Caspian Sea coast is reached. From there on, the aircraft would again maintain a safety distance from the Iranian coast to the southwest, and escorting fighters would establish a temporary combat air patrol station. Those aircraft equipped with air-to-air -air loads would create a safe operation zone above the southern Caspian Sea. This would ensure that any Iranian Air Force aircraft attempting to intercept the strike packages would face the superior Israeli Air Force fighters providing escort for them. The strike package would remain behind the radar horizon above the sea to stay undetected and then execute a quick high-speed dash to higher altitudes to release its standoff rampage missiles at a secure distance from the Iranian coast. From this position, the weapons would be launched at a distance of around 200 kilometers towards the capital city of Tehran. Arriving at supersonic speed and with its 150 kilogram warhead size, the quick reaction rampage missile could strike important targets in Tehran. The eastern regions which contain missile production sites, and west of Tehran, the adjacent city of Karaj, and its military production infrastructures. The strike package itself would then turn back towards the same path from which it came, or an alternative route, preventing Iranian air defenses or fighter aircraft from catching them in time. To enable the mentioned relatively short attack corridors inside Iranian airspace, other launch stations would be utilized to project fire control over the general region, where transits of strike packages occur. When combined with pre-prepared covert sabotage assets placed along the route, such as FPV drones and remote-controlled spike missile launchers, air defenses can be significantly suppressed. One such launch station would be oriented towards Tabriz and suited for fire control of the limited size attack corridors mentioned. Aircraft that had refueled at the refueling station too could also loiter for extended periods above the airspace of northern Iraq, with Turkey in between, and remain masked by the mountain summits present in that region. This would allow them to remain undetected by Iranian sensors and persistently loiter within the range of their rampage supersonic air-to-ground missiles. 
this would enable them to quickly launch these fast time of arrival weapons towards any emitter activity detected by US electronic intelligence satellites and other reconnaissance assets performing standoff surveillance. Hence, the combined attack corridor of just 150 kilometers above hostile territory would remain under Israeli fire control, either by standoff missiles or covert sabotage systems like Spike. This would deny any relocating Iranian air defense system the opportunity to pose a risk to the intruders. Furthermore, the range of the Rampage missile would enable secure attacks on Tabriz, the missile base is located there, and the local Air Force base with its MiG-29 interceptors that could threaten the Israeli fighters. A third launch location would be oriented towards the missile bases near Iran's Kerman Shah region. Here again, Masked by the mountain summits of the region, the aircraft could close in safely and dash into a high-speed climb to release the 200-kilometer range Rampage missile towards the missile bases in Kerman Shah. This launch station, when utilized to launch the ROC's air-launched ballistic missile, could also be used to attack the incomplete reactor in Iraq, which is well within the 500-kilometer range of the ROC's missile. A fourth alternative launch station would be oriented towards the missile bases in the Karamabad region. In this scenario, the strike package would split apart above the eastern Syrian desert and proceed towards a refueling station 2B located in the central Iraqi desert. That strike package would continue its flight and, once nearing populated areas, could descend to low-altitude flight trying to remain undetected by human spotters. Then, once close to the Iranian borders but still at a secure distance and masked by terrain, the aircraft would perform another high-speed dash climb to launch the Rampage missiles towards the missile bases in Khorramabad. Again, alternatively, if the ROC's air-launched ballistic missile is employed, even targets in Iran's strategic Isfahan region could be reached by the Israeli aircraft. Lower-cost compact cruise missiles like the Icebreaker could be used for such longer-range attacks at a lower price tag than the ROC's missile. From all those launch stations, the 200 to 300 kilometer range Delilah and Wind Demon miniature cruise missile could also be conveniently launched against targets which are not time critical and lack active anti-air protection. At all times, when the strike packages reach the launch stations close to Iran's borders, long-distance high-power barrage jamming could reduce threats from Iranian radars and air defense systems by degrading their performance and creating interference. U.S. fighters could additionally provide escort and air cover. Furthermore, AWACS, surveillance drones and aircraft equipped with long-range optical and synthetic aperture radar sensors would attempt to locate Iranian targets that are within reach of the different standoff missiles the Israeli aircraft would carry or local sabotage assets like Spike. If the air defenses in certain regions were sufficiently degraded by such operations, even bombing raids with glide bombs such as those from the up to 100-kilometer range, Spice family would be enabled. This would involve temporarily entering Iranian airspace and allow for more destructive, heavier warhead weapons to be used. For example, against the runways of the Tabriz Air Force Base and the missile tunnel entrances close to it. Even the possibility of aircraft crossing the 100 kilometers of the Alborz Mountains, entering from the northern Iranian Caspian coast to the capital city of Tehran, cannot be excluded. Creating a temporary corridor where air defenses are suppressed spanning just 100 kilometers, could very well be achieved by Israeli fighter bombers, supported by U.S. space-based electronic intelligence. In conclusion, this scenario illustrates how modern air operations and weapons easily explain the scenes we saw from the Israeli attacks on Iran. No air superiority is necessary for this. Only sophisticated planning, tactics, and weapon systems are required. Such a scenario of a more than 2,000 km strike route and the way back could alternatively be changed for a safer route via the eastern border regions of Turkey. But the key drawback in all scenarios is the long strike cycle periods such complex and distant missions cause. This in turn greatly limits the firepower the Israeli Air Force is able to project against an opponent like Iran. It also shows how dependent on support of its allies Israel is to perform such complex operations. So that's all for today. If you liked it, give a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. It really makes a difference in the YouTube algorithm and is a great support to the channel. The real enthusiast can become members and given access to exciting membership area material.
Thanks for your support and motivation. See you next time.